I have a treat for you today. Um, man, I, let me tell you something. The only thing I love more than teaching and preaching is hearing some good teaching and preaching. And today, I have brought a weapon of supernatural mass destruction to this house. Um, you might know him because he's a homeboy. His name is Raleigh Hurst. He is a homeboy to this church. He, he is of our soil. He's from here. But he's been, God has magnified him like God did Joshua. He's magnified him and allowed him to work with an organization called Fire Bible to um, not only uh, translate Bibles into languages for countries who don't have the word, but in those Bibles is also a, an education to help the regular person who reads it become a minister and expand their reach. And so this ministry is, I mean, it's life changing. I, I told our second service, both of my sons got a fire Bible. You are not gonna catch that kid, he is on the run. Run, boy, run. I used to get in trouble for that, but I think he should be rewarded. Because I'm at grandparent age now, and every baby is cute to me. I don't care what your kids do. Bring them in here. We'll enjoy it. But, man, it's, it's incredible to see how the, the word works when people who didn't have it receive it. And what he's able to do is get the word into uh, remote places and dangerous places and he's come to encourage us during our missions month emphasis. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to stand up on your feet and clap your hands and thank God for the man of God, Raleigh Hurst, as he comes to minister the word to us today. We love you. Raleigh Hurst. I'm feeling all sorts of love now. I saw that. I saw that. I felt that too, man. That's all good. <laughs> Welcome home. Can we please thank our pastors, uh, Pastor Allen and Hushmi? I'm, I'm assuming y'all are with them. You, you with them? Man, they're good looking too, man. That's awesome. I just want to thank you guys for sharing your parents with the world. I want to thank you. My dad was an evangelist, too. So I, I know a little bit. I know a little bit of how that is. But thank you. I am so overwhelmed to be home. I see family. And I see people here that I have not met yet. And I'm looking forward to it someday. And I know that we have eternity together. But um, I just... I can't, I can't thank you enough, Pastor, for the, for the privilege to come. I've been homesick, and I've been needing this, and it's been a minute. So thank you. You fill me up. And uh, uh, I'd just like to share a little bit about um, uh, what we do before uh, we get in the Word today. Uh, the Fire Bible, many people don't know what it is. It's simply uh, a study Bible. There's about 900,000 words in the biblical text, and there's about 1.3 million words of biblical study helps to help understand what we're doing. How many people sometimes need someone to help you, right? So this is going in languages. It's uh, currently in 67 languages around the world. The target is that it be in the top 100 languages to reach impact for the world. Uh, we have 67. We have 20 in process and another 25 in waiting on a list. And so... Uh, um, and so I'm now uh, starting a, uh, m the fourth and fifth projects that we're doing together. Uh, and I'm going back to my roots in the Pacific. I grew up as a barefoot missionary kid in, in Samoa um, before my dad became an evangelist like Pastor Allen. And uh, so it's, it's pretty cool how God brings us full circle. And he's brought me full circle home today. And I thank you uh, for the family that you guys have been to me. But I also want to welcome those who are coming here. And if you're looking for a family, you found one. And... Uh, and I welcome you in, a, in the name of Jesus Christ, and I bless you. Um, so that's just a little bit about the Fire Bible. Um, but what, how it became Fire Bible was something. It used to be called the Full Life Study Bible. And uh, it became from a missionary who uh, translated, uh, started doing translating study notes to help his Bible school students in Brazil understand the word. But something happened. He got cancer. And so he feverishly went 
and worked through the notes and got the study helps done and it finished the week he passed into eternity. This man never had the intention of doing anything other than helping the people that was in front of them. And in the kingdom of God, we all have our neighbor. And he was reaching toward his neighbor, the neighbor that he knew. And God blessed it. And this work is simply something God blessed. But the person who sowed that seed at the end of his life never got to see the hidden harvest that was in front of him. And he never knew the legacy in the, uh, uh, that God had hidden in him. He was a farmer. He was a simple, simple guy on a farm, had some Bible school training, and was just available. But I want to tell you people, too, there's a hidden harvest in you. And your availability, just even to your neighbor, into your community, into your church, into your family, and even in your giving beyond you, will reap something for Jesus Christ. And so that's simply a, a work that God has blessed. And it's a privilege to come. It's actually a family. Like this is a church family. Fire Bible is a family. It takes so many people to do this. We have amazing people in Springfield have given their lives just to formatting and doing different parts of the details. Like our serve team, there's a family Fire Bible serve team that does it. And so I celebrate them today because they, they're not up here. They don't get to sometimes go, but they're the ones who do so much of the work that make it possible for anyone else to go forward. And I just want to know, you are representing a family, but you're also mobilizing another family to do work. And so, um, but the name of this Bible changed. Um, first it was in Brazil, then it, it started catching fire, and they called the full essay. So they did it in English, and America took it over, and, and Pastor Alan and I, we, we had it growing up. And, and then it went into Spanish, took off, and then a friend of mine who just went to be with the Lord this last year, Ron Bearfield, uh, he had this heart in the, in the 90s to get this Bible into China with a group of other men. And they tried something that was never done. And so uh, he, they were asked, well, how many thousand can we get in there? A thousand. No, it's not enough. He goes, no. Okay. A million. We'll do a million Bibles. You know, you start casting vision. He goes, that's not enough. He said, well, what do you mean? A million Bibles? He goes, how many people are there in the underground church? Three million. Well, we're going to build three million Bibles. And so they didn't start small. They started big. And sometimes we're doing big. And, but what happened was the family of God started hearing about this effort, and everybody gave their little. And then a lot happened. And I will tell you that three million Bibles were given to the underground church. So, but what happened is when the gift was received, one of the underground leaders put this to his chest. He goes, my heart is burning. My heart's on fire. And so the underground church started talking about their fire Bible. So now it is the fire Bible. But, but the vehicle it got there wasn't someone here. It was you. Lay people, faithful family members in the church one by one, took them in their suitcases, took them to, into the country to make it possible. Three million Bibles were brought in by the family of God. And then we know that doors closed down and what have you, but it is now estimated that on their own, you know how China can make their own things and make things over other things? That we know of at least 10 million that they've reprinted on their own to expand the work. And that underground church has exploded, and they are now sending missionaries out into unreached areas. So it is, it's beautiful to see what God can do when the family all does something with their little. So I thank you uh, for your monthly giving to Fire Bible. You've made it possible on multiple projects and, um, and as we're stepping out in this fourth and fifth. So I want to thank you. Um, can we pray? Father, we thank you for this time that we come together. I thank you. You know everybody in this room. And we just pause to say thank you, Lord. We want to give you thanks, Lord, for what you see and not what we, we see, for what you know and what we don't know. So I ask you, Lord, that all glory, all honor, all praise be to you, our Father, our Christ, and our Comforter. May this family be one as you are one. And I pray, Lord God, that you would expand the reach and territory in this city, 
in their families, and throughout your global family. We give you this day in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 10. And I want to share something uh, today that God put in my heart when I was visiting a church planner uh, out in, uh, through the desert near the border of Pakistan and India. And uh, I just, I met a guy and he said there was this guy that needed someone to visit and some sparked my heart. So you just see opportunity and you go and, and the Lord strengthened my heart in this. And this is before I ever came with Fire Bible. Uh, I wasn't even supposed to be there. I brought a team of pastors to do a pastor's training conference for church planners. And we just went out. But in that desert on the road, the Lord gave me uh, this to challenge me. And I hope it can strengthen and bless you. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and heal every kind of disease and illness. And then verse 7. Go announce to them, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, and cast out demons. Give freely as you have received. Give freely as you have received. There's two things I see here. And number one is, we have a God who trusts us. Trust is a form of the, uh, high love. It's intimacy. How does it feel to be trusted? I came here to this church as an untrained minister. I was a college coach. My wife was in corporate sales. And God just put it on our heart. And the Holy Spirit uh, led the, the, the church leadership here to hire us. And, but I came here untrained, un, un, unavailable. And that trust I was given to be a youth pastor here and to serve kids that I didn't feel ready for, it was overwhelming. The love, it was intimidating too. Because it's like, how am I going to do this, right? We had great kids like Pastor Heather here, right? So she made it easy. But, and we had this great youth evangelist that would come through, and he'd come every free Wednesday he had. He would come in here and pour it in. I think you might know him, Alan Griffin. So he, he was a great mentor to me too. But we all need a start in life. We all need someone to trust us, to give us that first open door, that first opportunity. Do you remember when you were a teenager and you first got to drive? Your parents gave you, it didn't matter what that car like. It, it could have been a station wagon beat up. It didn't matter. You got your first taste of independence and freedom. I'm going to go where I want to go when I want to go there. And it's just, wow, my parents trust me. This is happening. These, God is trusting them, not with something as temporal as a car, but something that is eternal. He's trusting them with the family of God, the family that hasn't even been brought, brought back home yet. He's trusting him. But then I love in verse 7, give freely as you received. We need to understand that we have a giving God. All good things that come from him. But there's something I, I appreciate this. And, and when I was reading this in that car, it means that I have something to give. I didn't feel equipped. I mean, this is messed up. I was an untrained minister. One of the mantras about the fire Bible is I've heard... When I started out, the dangers of an untrained minister. Look out. You just hired one. <laughs> but I was trained. I was trained here. I was trained by the family of God. Yes, by leadership, but mostly by its laity, by the family here. I don't know. There's a Sunday school class by a guy named Dr. Spencer. Check it out. I asked him. He was the first youth sponsor I recruited. I had him sit down. I said, you hold me accountable for every word I say. That millstone thing scares me. I don't know about you. You know what I'm saying? And he, he would take his time and help me through the scriptures. His gift to give. So I receive from him. So the only thing I give is things I have received from this family. God is going to give you something when you're here that's going to lead into a purpose for your life. And it's going to be for others. But it's going to bless you in the meantime. So let's turn to chapter 11. Let's turn to chapter 11. And I say this because that's a great day. It is a great day when you get trusted. I mean, one thing with a car. Another thing with other people's kids. Being trusted with the word of God when you don't, you know, straight up, I'm dyslexic. It's work. Untrained dyslexic. 
building Bibles. I sound like Alan up. Yeah. Let's go to chapter 11. Thank you for your time. If it's okay if I get in the Word today a little bit, spend some time. Chapter 11, verse 1. We saw a good day. Let's look at a bad day. When Jesus had finished giving these instructions to the 12 disciples, he went out and teach and preach in the region. John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about these things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah who we've been expecting? Or should we be looking for someone else? Let's think about Jesus for a moment. And if you're taking notes, uh, this message in my heart is Jesus on a bad day. It's Jesus on a bad day. It's not good news when the people close to you, closest to you doubt you. Now, if someone questions you, it's really important that you respect them and you come to them personally. You know what I'm saying? Iron sharpens iron. We can do that. But unfortunately, John was in prison, and he did not have that opportunity. And it's unfortunate the only way for that message to get delivered was publicly. But the importance of this is, who is John the Baptist? He's Jesus' family. It's his cousin. Who is John the Baptist? He was the one that was set apart from God to prepare the way for Jesus' work in ministry, to redeem every person out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist was put apart. Thirdly, no one else knew the burden of Jesus more than John the Baptist. The weight of your work, the weight of your responsibility, he's the one. And now at this point, he is being publicly doubted. And in this moment, a cloud of doubt is now resting over Jesus' ministry. Because, see, he didn't talk to him. He had to talk about him. So Jesus, what kind of response, what kind of God do we have? Who is Jesus? How will he handle when the person closest to him hurts him? We all have wounds. We all care. He's fully God, yet he's fully man. And yet, the closest wounds come from the ones closest to us. What response would we do? But here we see Jesus do something very healthy. In verse 4, go back to John. And tell them what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, and those with leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised to life. And the good news is bring preach to the poor. He simply is doing, what are the facts? He also understands where John is. It's not just about Jesus' work. He understands where John is. If your life is being taken away, if your life is being threatened... If the expectations of what your heart and life and work were set out before you, and it's, it's not meeting the expectations, what happens? Has anyone ever here experienced anxiety? <laughs> okay. There's a skill called cognitive behavioral therapy, and one of the skill sets they help us when we, when we experience uh, anxiety or doubt or cognitive distortion is simply ask yourself the question, what are the facts? Jesus is is being a a, a loving God here by helping him to order his thoughts, right? So that's the first thing. But that's, God is, like, we're supposed to be second milers? Look at this second mile here, okay? He he did work, but now he says this in verse 7. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. What kind of man did you go in the wilderness to see? Was he a weak reed? Uh, swayed with every breath. He's saying, are you flip-flopping? Is he double-minded? No. Or were you expecting to see a man dressed in expensive clothes? A man uh, in dressed in expensive No, people with expensive clothes live in palaces. Were you looking for a prophet? Hear this. Yes, he is more than a prophet. Yeah, he is who you thought he was. And he still is. But he's even more. And God, in our doubt, sees more. There's even more that he has designed and prepared for you. You see, he sees the beginning from the end. And outside of all the time, our creator designed us to be in this time, in this town, in this family. And there's a purpose to that. There's even more. But in the presence of doubt and anxiety, sometimes we can't even comprehend more. He's saying, 
John the Baptist is even more than a prophet. Verse 11, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. He's saying he's the greatness. He's the greatest. He sees greatness in you. You see, this isn't exactly John the Baptist's best moment, right? How does the world receive us, right? When we have our worst moment, do people take receipts, right? We take receipts. We remember that. We focus on what people aren't often. But Jesus is focusing on who we are. We have a loving God who's focusing on who we are in the future that he's prepared for us to be. Not on what we aren't. Not that fear, doubt, and unbelief come our way. He's focusing on the greatness that's hidden in you. He's seeing you in your future. He's seeing you in your finished work. And he's a loving God seeing you all the way through. He that began that good work in you will see it through to what? Till its completion. We can rest and have confidence in God. But here we see John the Baptist. He's in debt. Doubt. But then he says he goes even farther from the time that John Baptist began preaching. He's saying, hold it. This message is going back to John in prison. Man, it's not even happening. It's going on. You started it. Do you know that every person in here has an assigned harvest, assigned something that you're supposed to spark in an apostolic manner, that you're going to start some new chain reaction within the family of God? And you say you don't even see the more, but your God sees the more. There is more hidden in you. And there's a hidden harvest that is beyond us that is only seen in the eyes of faith and obedience. But there's more. He says, from the time he started with you, the kingdom of God has forcefully advanced. John the Baptist was a force. He was to be contended. Man, those leaders in Israel feared him. He was calling things as they were. Truth. Truth. He says, yes, the kingdom of heaven is now forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. So he's saying is, yes, as the family of God is moving forward, there's opposition. And you in that prison are feeling that opposition. But you started something that's never going to stop. You started something that is impossible to stop. (laughs) See, some of us, we, we say we don't have enough, right? There are some people here with immense talents. You see... What can you give to God what you've received? Coming here, the Lord told me this. I was untrained to be a youth pastor. I said, Lord, I'm on my knees. I mean, when you got to start taking care of kids, what am I doing? You know what he told me? Look for people more spiritual than you. Look for others. And I found in others... In this house, I saw greatness, and I saw more, and I saw God do something very beautiful and special. There are people in this room and the other services that came in and ministered to those youth in a way that I couldn't. There is more hidden in you. And forcefully advancing the kingdom of God, it takes all of us. It takes the family doing this work. So what does it look like coming against this opposition? What are we looking for in a family? Well, I heard someone uh, give this definition of what strength is. Strength is the ability to absorb force, but it's also the ability to create force. And I shared shared before, like when I I was sent out of this church to go in missions in Thailand, and I got there, and a pastor friend of ours gave me a bit of advice. He says, when you go to Bangkok, you need to do Muay Thai training. The world comes in there to do mixed martial arts training. What? You know, I'm going there to bring the gospel, bring the good news of uh, the gospel, and, and bring the love of Jesus into a dark place, and you want me to go train mixed martial arts? And I said, you ever take inventory? You know, I got a mirror, man. I got a mirror, you know. First of all, you see mixed martial arts, they can kick from so far out, they can punch. I got, God gave me these short little arms. They barely reach my pocket sometimes. I got these short little legs. I'm a six foot two Oompa Loompa, man. I just, I just, you know, they don't, I can't get clothes at the mall. And I'm rotund. Do I look, I mean, how many round shaped mixed martial arts? I said, man. So I get to Bangkok, took note. That's my receipt. I get down there and I met a missionary who was called there, coming by faith to work in the mixed martial arts community there. 
And he goes, man, I need someone to help me open a door in this gym. And they need like a big guy coming in here because they don't have many big guys there. Would you please come here and help? So I'm like, okay. Sometimes we have to open doors for others. And I remembered what our pastor friend told me. I'm like, wow, okay. So I'll go down there. You first find out, okay, absorb force, create force. I am a six foot two weeble wobble. I am literally just a big, round, soft kicking bag, punching bag. And it didn't take me long to take inventory. Okay, I'm not gonna succeed from a distance. So what I figured out, there's other strikes available. Oh, I can't punch from afar, but if I get in close, I can use my knees, my elbows. I can even grapple and hold this guy out till he, he, he gets disinterested. I'm a hugger, not a fighter. I didn't want to be there. I'm trying to help, help my brother out, and, but I learned. First of all, sometimes in our lives we're going to have to take a hit. But then within that system that God's built us that we can move forward and advance. So we can't always be on our heels, right? So think about it. When, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when we're against this opposition, it doesn't say over. It doesn't say around. It says through. And some people here today may be facing an opposition. And I want to help you understand. You are strong. And there's a force within you that God can strengthen and encourage you to help you lean in to the work you have. So... This was a bad day for Jesus. I want to turn to chapter 14 real quick. And this is the day I want to see where colliding accounts happen. I want to call out the men for a sec. You ever have a good day? You come home, you're just like, hey, family, we got it. We got it covered. We got it, man. It's just great. And you are so stoked about how good your day is. You forget about the crying kids there. You don't see them. You don't, dinner's burned, you know. Just the house is in chaos, but my vision and purpose, this is great. I'm having a great day. The family's having a bad day. Sometimes it's not there, right? Some days when we're having a bad day, the last thing we want to hear is, is someone's good day, right? Well, here we see Jesus on a bad day. News comes to him. Chapter 14, if I can turn to it. There it is. Chapter 14. So John the Baptist is beheaded in prison. And then they went and told Jesus what happened in verse 11. Let's pick it up uh, in verse 13. So as soon as Jesus heard the news, he was left in a boat. He left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. Remember, God is fully God, but he's fully man. And he, he wanted to experience every little thing that we encounter. Our sorrows, our hurts. He experienced them all. And here, he's doing something very elemental. When we have grief and loss, sometimes we can lose, lose a friend or a loved one and things aren't reconciled. He did, there's no evidence that he got to see John the Baptist again. So he wants to withdraw. But something's at stake. Here we see how to lead on a bad day from Jesus because we're all going to have bad days. We remember the bad ones. We remember the good ones. But we have to contend for Christ on both. Okay, so let's turn quickly to Mark 6, 32. Uh, Mark 6, 30 through 32. The apostles return from their ministry tour. They're coming back from their first missions trip. They just got to see the power of God. They got to see sick people get well. They got to see people come into the love of God, their, their true father. They got the keys to the kingdom, and they got some stories to tell. They got some good news. But they're coming home to Jesus who wants to withdraw. So what's Jesus' response? And this is something we can take note of as disciples and followers of Christ. Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest for a while. And it goes on to say that he noticed that the, his disciples didn't even have deemed to eat. Jesus Listen to all they had said and taught. Think about it. When you're having a bad day, does your listening skills go up or down? Yet, in his heart and his love and, and his, his plan for them, he is training them. He's training them how to contend. He's training them how to overcome. 
Are there any other over- overcomers in this room? Because of what Jesus did? But you know, sometimes those obstacles are divine opportunities. So let's go back to Matthew 14. This is in all four Gospels, and we know this day. This is the day of the feeding of the 5,000. For many of you who grew up in children's church, you have heard about all this. But what I want to say to us as Christ followers, have we considered that Jesus was in grief and loss? That Jesus was being doubted? His, his very ministry foundation was being challenged by the people closest to him, around him, and news, you know, news gets out. This is what Jesus is facing. So then he says, Jesus, it says in verse 14, he saw the huge crowd as he stepped off the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. And the other gospels talked about how he he taught them about the kingdom of of heaven. And then so all the disciples in force, had they eaten yet? So what happened? He listened, he loved, he was meeting the needs of his disciples. But then through the eyes of of the Father, through Jesus. He looked out and saw the world. He saw the crowds. He saw and had compassion. But compassion is not just an emotion. It's a focus. I know contenders. We heard about a team of men that went up and they helped demo a house so someone else could have a new beginning. I know one of those people. By the way, I'm a caregiver. I have a disabled child that was brought up in this church. And it's taken the whole church to get us through, to send us to send us go. This person is also one of those members is a caregiver. He had a tough, t- challenging week, yet he stepped forward, advanced, and served. And now he's out there serving him. He served in all three services. He's leading on a bad day. So how are we contending for this harvest? Compassion isn't just a feeling, it's a focus. When you look at Winston-Salem First Focus, you will see a long list of ministries that the Father sees that he wants the family of God to contend for. You see, God sees our hearts. First of all, what's our role? We are the priesthood of the believer. What is our primary role as a Christ follower and a royal priest? It's to minister to the heart of God. And what can we know about the heart of God? If he knows everything hidden in our pain, in our suffering, in our loss, in our grief, we get to look back at what Jesus did. He is the visible image of the invisible God. God has a compassion for every person here, even those who doubt us, even those that wound us. He has compassion for those who are hungry. He's a father to the fatherless, and there is a family, a formidable force here at WSF that is moving forward. But beyond that, we see the disciples hold it. We got this mass of people. We're still hungry. I mean, everyone by the end of the day, imagine you're hungry. But he's saying, hold it. Send them away. Let them go take care of it by themselves. That's that's good thinking. Hey, man, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Everybody get their done. You do your fair share. He says something messed up. He says, you feed them. You feed them. You see, when God gives us authority and he gives us the ability to reach the family of God, you see, our days are ordered of God. Our our paths are ordered. Do you know that every one of those interruptions that you have on your bad days, God already knew and saw? That obstacle is an opportunity. He's saying you feed them. How is that even possible? You've known the story. Yes, he's having a bad day. But let's turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. You see, because not only is this about God trusting us, he's also training us. He's training us to see as he sees. He's training us to act as he acts. He says, you feed them. Is that possible? Verse 5. Jesus soon saw a crowd, people coming and going, looking for him. Turning to Philip, man, this is amazing. He's taking care of everybody in the midst of one of the worst. This is probably the second worst day he encountered that we have in Scripture. And he says says to Philip, where can we buy? Goes from you to we. How, How do you know that with many hands work comes light, right? But when it's you and you feel alone and you don't have the resources, it's your time, it's your talent, it's your it's your gifts. 
and your resources. We. Philip says, if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough. You see, in our own doubt, in the cloud of doubt that's over Jesus' ministry, we went from the kingdom of God advancing, people getting in six, and all of a sudden we're seeing all the blessings of God, and now we're looking at scarcity. We're looking at what things aren't instead of what they are. And Jesus, so when we're saying well, we wouldn't have enough, what we're really questioning, and we're brought, and the, and the disciples were taken, is Jesus enough? When you ask of who Jesus is in your life, I don't have enough strength. I don't have the ability to get that job. I don't have enough. Is Jesus enough? He's enough for that next step. He's enough for that next meal. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, there's a boy here with five bar lilies and two fish. But what good is that? Let's go back to 14. This day is in all four Gospels. It's about a loving God equipping the family of God to reach those who have not been reached, to help the hurting, to help the lost. And then we say, he says, hey, here it is. Bring them here. So we went from you feed them to we feed them and took an insignificant offering, something that is not enough in natural terms. In the natural terms, have them go get their own food to something divine. Have you ever seen God handle bread? It says he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it. See, as he received, he gave, but there was a process. He took it, he received, he blessed it, he brought it before heaven and the Father. And then he broke it, and then he gave it to be multiplied through others. That's what we're here today. Today we're a collective family moving forward for the collective global family of God. In your house, in your home, in your community, in your church, into places that we'll never see or know. Is Jesus enough? What good would even that be? He took this insignificant offering, and we know what happens. He took the bread, he blessed it, and then everyone was fed, and everyone was full, and there was left, he, you know, it says over, don't waste the leftovers. See, even more could be taken care of, right? Think about that lunch for a moment. That boy gave only something he received. Did he bake that bread? Did the boy bake the bread? Did he catch, go out in a boat and catch that fish? He gave, it says, freely give as you have received. So there's something about what a small and insignificant portion of what we are and what God can do. I was sent in my first assignment to Myanmar. I had, uh, we were in Thailand, you know the Oompa Loompa, whatever that is, learning about how to take a hit. We took a hit. My daughter uh, almost died there. And uh, a doctor in this church told us, you've got to leave now. He opened his home. We moved from Thailand. Uh, we gave everything away, flew here, moved into his home for four months. Another person in the last service prepared a house for us off the old church property. And so there would be a place for our family to land and prepare and start a new beginning and just see if my daughter could make it. My wife was, it was, it was a bad time. Our expectations of what we went out there for and do, I had no idea. But I came back, and other leaders came around, and you guys have all supported us for more than 17 years. Every month, every month of that 17 years, you guys have been sending just another family member from here. Listen, I'm not a 10-talent guy. I'm not a 5-talent guy. I'm a 2-talent guy. I believe in God, and I believe in this family. That's what he's given me. And he taught me here to look for the greatness in others. And I've seen in this house, and I can tell you, I see you. You have inspired me for decades. You don't think I saw how you carried your son up those steps? Contenders are in this house. And I came to this point. I had leaders telling me, 
to do this fire Bible thing. I didn't understand it. There was a widow that was in the last offering, came up, and I was like, okay, am I going to take this other top opportunity? I can stay home, take care of myself. It made sense. So go send the people away to feed themselves. The, this family challenged me. And this widow came up, and she made a decision. And for every month, she says, God called me to do this. And she put it in my face. That was the tipping point. When I saw the formative force of this family, you sent me into something I didn't see or understand or know. And so we began a, a project. I told you, this is a, a Bible school and a book for many people. And he sent me to an area that had been blocked off for a, uh, for a long period of time. In that area in northern Myanmar, there was no electricity or cell phones. So I'd go in there a couple weeks at a time, go in and meet. There I met someone who didn't count. Uh, in a moment, I want to show you some pictures. But four-year-old boy, a bad day happened. Lost his mother. His dad was gone, checked out. He was gone most of the year. He was a traveling businessman. And he just was trying to make the best he could. And, but it left him alone to be raised by a 14-year-old daughter, 14-year-old uh, niece, uh, a family member. And he worked in the rice fields. And when he became a young teenager, this is a heavy conflict area. It's a, I want to be careful because I so respect this country, but they have problems. Like we have gangs in America that are opposing uh, things. They have factions there that they can jump people in just like a gang. And he got jumped in uh, by a military. He either had to fight for them or he would die. He didn't know anything. He didn't have anyone looking out for him. He didn't have that education. He didn't have, have some of the benefits we have and know. Well, Tyke, he chose survival. And you know what it's like. Some of us know what it's like to be in survival mode. I've been a caregiver for 21 years. I have a taste of it, but nothing like the others I see. They're not the great people that I see. And here... He get ju jumped in, and then the government caught the, the, the group that he was representing, and he was branded a traitor. And then sent on a work gang, like you, you've seen those, where they chain him ankle and foot and by the waist. And there he had to break rock to create roads. This is an undeveloped area, and he broke rock 12 hours a day. They gave him one meal in the morning, one meal at night. For one year, 11 months, and two weeks. He did that until God sent someone to find a way to advocate him amnesty. And then he ran and fled. And it wasn't until he was almost 30 years old. He got sick. He was hiding out in the jungle. Some of us are just withdrawn and hiding out and surviving. But God found him. In his sickness, he was in bed, and he didn't know if he'd live or die. There was the daughter of a missionary girl from China who had a New Testament, and she gave up her New Testament. You cannot get Bibles very easily in that room. Mostly just pastors, and pastors are... are taking care of five, six, eight village churches on different mountains, and they just do a circuit. One book, one messenger, going. He got a Bible. And with that Bible, on his own, like many of you, maybe you're like, man, I don't know about this. I don't get in the Word. Jesus is right here. He worked through the Scriptures, and he came to the Lord on his own understanding and terms. But in with that, Something changed. He, he now had the bravery not to hide. Instead of hiding in the jungles, he went down to the biggest city. And there he, he, he boldly tried to make a new life for himself. Then he heard about a Bible school. And he gave his life to that Bible school. And he was, he was branded. Those Bible school boys, 35 of them were against him, and they physically threatened him. Only four stood with him. Fast forward. He graduated, became a, a, a church planner and pastor, and just started rocking it for God. Fast forward that, those same 35 boys that were against him, that were opposing him, all the doubt that was cast over him because something he got jumped into, they voted him in, and he became the leader of his tribe's church for the entire tribe. And along the way, there was a, a missionary who came into Yangon for a day, and he had a Bible with him. And it was the fire Bible, and he gave up his fire Bible. 
And he learned English through this work that you've been giving. And there he says, this is my heart. This is my life. And he had a singular vision that someday he could give the word that saved him. That he could equip and train the next generation. Well, in that time frame when we were here, the budget was raised. There was a cloud of doubt over our family. This family stood up and contended for a harvest that you have not seen. Just like the author of this, he had no idea when he passed away from cancer, the blessing in it. And the same thing as the people in this room, you contended. And that widow, that was the tipping point. Okay, y'all took care of my family. It took two years for my daughter to establish. In that time, you sent me back and forth to that place. You took care of my family. You sent me to go help the, your family beyond. I want to show you pictures. This is from Tyke's first year as the lead uh, of, of his church. He visited every church in under a year. He was only home 26 days. This is the, this is the terrain that they had to uh, go through. They would vi visit in a lot of these mountaintops in the churches, and then they would sleep in the jungles at night. And there they would strengthen and encourage the family of God. He then later on gave up being the leader of his church because you guys sent and created the opportunity to build this book for his people. And he gave it up to be the coordinating editor, and he feverishly worked on this to do it. The Bible says we must work while it is day, for when night comes, no man can work. We had an open door. Just like you have open doors in your workplace, you have open doors in your home, you have time with different people, you have neighbors that come through and go. He had an open door. You guys sent us through that open door, and he finished this book. And he sent me back, him with the leadership of the church. They didn't thank me. They didn't thank the leaders because they have a different understanding. In, in, in Lisa culture, they have a saying, we do not have, so we give what we do have. So they have a very great understanding of, of what it means to give to others. He says, go back to the people in the church in America who gave us this book and thank them. And thank you, the leaders, for having the vision to reach us. So, Pastor, I thank you. Let's say them first, thank you on behalf of Tyke. Your giving is a formidable force for the family of God. Thank you.